Yeah. He's just talking. All right. Buffers today. Woohoo! This I know I will spill it. I spilled it yesterday all over my pants. Um, like we began talking about yesterday, the most important application for acid-based solutions is going to be one containing a common ion for the purposes of buffering. Okay, and I think I might have just given you the quick little definition of what a buffer solution is. It is a solution. The buffers. Yeah, it buffers. But yes. what does it buffer? Oh. Buffers the pH, or it resists a change in the pH. So if you have a buffer solution, you could add some strong acid and some strong base, and it would be able to withstand uh, adding something strong without seeing an extremely uh, big change in the pH, like if you were to add that to water. All right? So by definition here, it is a solution that resists a change in pH when you add hydroxides or your hydrogen ions, which typically are going to come obviously from your acids and your bases. Okay? Now, here's how you create a buffering solution. The purpose of yesterday was to kind of get you familiar with the common ion. A buffering solution will always contain either a weak acid or weak base and a salt that has the conjugate of it. Everybody hear what I said? A buffering solution will either have a weak acid or a weak base with a salt that has a conjugate of that weak acid or weak base. So an example would be, there's a weak acid, HF, all right, that's going to break up into this. There's its conjugate. So we would want to have a salt that we would dissolve in it that has what in it? So an uh, easy one to throw in there would be NAF. And the reason why I'm throwing that in there is because what is NA going to do? Yeah, it's going to do anything because it's neutral. So what you have is your common ion, which is what we talked about yesterday. When you have a certain amount of acid and a certain amount of base, what you have then is you can add a strong acid or strong base to this situation, and it will buffer a significant change in pH, and we'll talk about how it does that as we progress. Right. So let's start with this problem. This is kind of uh, familiar from what we did yesterday. It's very similar to what we did yesterday, but it's going to lay the foundation for uh, uh, what's ahead. So this is just figure out the pH of a buffer solution. The next problem we're going to do is we're going to add a strong acid or a strong base to the buffer solution, and we're going to see how much it pH is going to change, or how well the buffer solution is going to resist a change in pH. And then we'll talk about, break down the, the ideas of, of why you don't see an extremely big pH change. So we got a buffer solution. It contains acetic acid and a salt with the conjugate of that acid. All right. So the species that we have that are important, we're going to have our weak acid. All right. The salt's going to completely dissociate into its component parts. And we're going to have water. Well, we know that this is very weak, so it's really not important. We know that this is what? Neutral. Now, neutral properties. And these are, are, are our important things we're going to deal with. 
right? So our chemical equation that we're focusing on here then. like yesterday, this is pretty much identical to the problem we did yesterday. Just showing you quickly how you're going to find the pH of a buffer solution one more time here. Okay. What's the initial concentration? associates completely and gives off that many of that particular ion. Okay? Still going to shift right, even though it's going to shift left less right than it would have had it not had the common ion in it. So this in and remove the x's is that the 0.5's are going to cancel. You want me to actually show that whole thing? So when I remove the x's, these 0.5's are going to cancel, so x just equals your ka. The H plus concentration should give us our pH, correct? Why don't I use the have to know that. Well, yeah, let's know that they're the same. Right? If they're the same, yeah, but I, I this chapter is going to get a little bit more confusing because they're not always going to be the same. And I, and, and since it doesn't take a whole lot of time to do that ice table real quickly, I was just fine doing it. But if you're fine understanding that principle, by all means, you know, use the shortcuts. Just be careful. I totally understand. I'm a big fan of shortcuts. Trust me. <coughs> What's pH? In fact, we are going to show you an equation in a couple days that will shorten some of this stuff. It's a It's called the henderson hasselhoff equation. No, it's called the, yeah, I just, well, that's what I call it. It's actually the Henderson Hasselhoff. But I just say Henderson Hasselhoff. Okay, pH is 4.74. Okay, so that is the pH of this buffer solution. So, in theory, then, if I were to add strong acid or strong base, this solution would buffer the pH around that. What I mean by that is, is that the pH would change a little bit, but it wouldn't deviate very far from 4.74, assuming you had enough of the buffering solution to be able to withstand a significant change in acid or base. All right, that's what we're going to do on the next problem, which is considerably more difficult. And it is new. There is some new stuff. So now, same problem. We're going to compare the change we would have with the buffer from what we had original. So our original pH original buffer pH was 4.74 Okay? <coughs> now, what is the thing that we are doing to this buffer solution? Which is a strong, strong base. Oh, yes. Okay, so we are adding a strong base to our buffer solution problem. Okay, just quickly identifying what our major species are. So 
we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. We have our acid. Okay. We had our sodium, which was one ion from the salt, and we also had our conjugate. We had our water. But now, technically, we also have one more thing that's important here. We have that. Correct? Why do I say we have that? Yeah, this is going to completely dissociate, giving us more sodium ions, which are neutral. So that's not important, right? This is weak, so that's not important. These are my buffer components, and we've added a weak or a strong base. Make sense? Okay. Well, this is really strong. Okay, and obviously that's our base, right? So that OH is going to react with the most dominant acid. What is our dominant acid here? Not really our only acid here. So our reaction here is going to be our acid with our strong base. What is that going to produce? C2H2O2 and water. There's water. So that is our reaction that we are going to focus on. This is a strong base. You guys all understand why the OH is going to react with this and not with water. This is a stronger acid than water, so it's going to react with the stronger acid. This? Yeah. A stronger base, but not stronger than this one. So it's still going to drive the reaction this way. This is so strong that we're going to say, and we're always going to assume when we do these buffer problems and we add a strong acid or a strong base, that this reaction will go to completion. Okay. Oh. Okay? Because what we have to do is now we have to add another step before we do our ice table stuff. So, step one. And step two is when we do our ice table stuff like we've been doing. Right? And I like to write a before and an after. And we are going to assume completion. With me? Sure? Okay? We're going to assume this is going to react all the way to completion. So what we need to figure out is how many moles of each of these things I have. Okay? What was the concentration of this from our previous problem? That was 0.5. It was 0.5. And it was uh, 0.5 moles per liter, right? right? And we had a liter solution, correct? Mm -hmm. So we should have 0.5 moles of this. Does that make sense? Everybody. Okay? We know how many moles of this we have because they told us. Now, if they give you concentrations and then they give you a volume, you might have to use that volume to figure out the moles. But if they say per one mole and then you, or per one liter and you only have a liter, then you can just assume it's the same number. Okay? This is not important for the sake of studying geometry here. And we had some of this, right? Because this is part of our, our buffer solution. We also had 0.5 of this as well. You guys remember that from the previous problem? Yes. Okay? So what we are going to do is we're going to react all of this to have nothing. Well, everything's a what ratio? One to one. One to one. And it's going to proceed that way. So I'm going to react all of this 
and I'm going to be gaining that over here. Everybody see what's going on here? <coughs> this will go to zero. This will go to 0.49. And this will go to 0.51. Questions so far? So when we add that strong ass or strong base in there, it's going to react with the, the acid of the buffer and convert a strong base into a weak base. Okay? Now we can do step two. So this will be step one. Step two is our original ice table. Okay, we're going to use, we're still in a one liter solution everything up here, correct? So this mole number divided by one liter just is the same number, 0.49 molar. Okay. which is gone. So we go back to our original buffer problem after we've done the stoichiometry. All the OH from our strong base is eliminated. It's gone. We can go back to our original buffer and we essentially just have less of this and more of this. Skip this ice table stuff. You probably are pretty familiar with what it's going to look like. So your Ka, what was our Ka from the previous one? All right, one point eight times ten to the negative fifth. And then we would have had this is going to be x, okay? And then this would be 0.51 plus x. We're going to eliminate that x, right? And this is going to be 0.49 minus x, but we're going to eliminate that x for the 5% test. Am I, am I doing too much? Am I abbreviating too much, or is everybody following? Okay. Now notice how similar this looks from the previous buffer problem. Wasn't this just 0.5 and 0.5 in the previous buffer problem? We added 0.01 moles of a strong base, and this is how much it affected it. So what your x is then, when you do the math, is 1.7 times 10 to the negative fifth. I'm telling you right now, if I took this and went over my initial concentration, it's going to follow the 5% test. Okay, so I'm going to save the extra work of putting in trying to figure out the 5% test. Okay, so this is my H plus concentration. Your pH is the negative log of that. Four point seven six. So, adding that strong base, did it affect the pH much? Yeah. I mean, not, not much. No. no, not much at all. Let me show you how much it would have affected it if we just put that strong base in water. Let's say I had 0.01 molar NaOH and I just plopped it in water from last chapter. That would completely dissociate which means I have 0.01 molar OH minus. So I can find POH by doing negative log of that. So 
someone do that for me quickly? which means pH is 14 minus 2, which means your pH, had you just added that directly to water, would have been 12. Oh, okay. Yeah, for, for decimals, if it's just a 0.01, it's 10 to the negative second, 10 to the negative third, 0.001. Yeah, that's for the chain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's the chain of pH is 0.02. But had we plopped that directly into water, the change would have been 5. So the question I'm hoping you're starting to ask yourself is, why were we a why was this buffer solution able to resist a, a change in pH? What was the secret of this? Here's the secret. A strong base was converted to a weak base. That's the secret of these buffer solutions. What you notice is we have we had equal amounts of acid in its conjugate base. If I add base, it'll react with the acid to just convert it to a weak base. If I would have added an acid, it would react with the conjugate base to produce a weak acid. And so what you end up doing is taking something that is strong and converting it into something that is weak really easily. Okay? Questions so far? It's a lot. It's important to understand the key kicker here is that what we're doing is we're taking the strong thing and we're converting it into something weak. Because we know the weak thing stays dissociate or stays together, right? Okay? This completely dissociated, but if I convert it to the weak base, that's gonna stay together. Okay? And if it's gonna stay together, is it gonna contribute much to the pH or change the pH much? No. So what I want to do is kind of summarize this. Here are some things that help us hopefully understand this buffer solution. What? Okay, so how does it work? So the buffering solution, the pH is governed by this. I don't know if you guys know this, but when we were doing the stoichia, or when we were doing the, the problem, we had our Ka, and it was our H plus concentration, and we had our conjugate base over our weak acid. Okay, if we were doing it, if we were doing a, a start with a, a weak base, this would just be flipped. These two guys. This is a constant, right? So couldn't I solve for H plus? That's a constant, so that's not gonna have an effect. So what determines the pH is basically this ratio. So here's some things that are really important. We're going to talk about this much more when we do, when we, when we spend some more time talking about what makes a buffer a really good buffer. Here's, here's kind of alluding to some of those things. If the amounts of your conjugates are large, which is what we had, didn't we have 0.5 of each of my conjugates? Compared to the amount of either strong acid or strong base that you add, we had 0.01 of my strong base. Then what you notice, our ratio at the beginning was 0.5 over 0.5. Our ratio once we added the strong base was 0.51 over 0.5. Four, nine. Do you notice that the ratio is relatively constant here? 
So, there are a few things that are important. You want these two numbers to be equal, and you want them to be big. Why would you want them to be big? It has a stronger buffering capacity if it's bigger. Right? If, I, if this was 10 over 10, and I change it by 0.01, that's going to be even a smaller change in the ratio, right? Okay, now I do want to summarize all this on this next slide. This is more of the process here. What? This is more of the process here than it is we're doing a math problem. Okay? First off, buffering solutions. What are they? What do they consist of? Have you figured that out yet? Yep. So buffer solutions. for solutions, we're going to do steps like we did in chapter 14, last chapter. Okay? When we're just trying to figure out what the pH of a buffer solution is, we're going to do everything like chapter 14. That's what we did the very first problem today. And Grant made the, the, the distinction, he said, well, if we know that it's 0.5 and 0.5, can we just say that the x is your is your ka oh yes then what we did second part of today is we added a strong base but you could also add a strong acid said there is one little subtle thing you got to do that's different. First step was what? What do we have to do? Well, I do the stoichiometry. Once we did the stoichiometry, we could then do our ice table equilibrium calculations. Right? <clears throat> so your buffering system. thing that makes a buffering system good is you want to have large quantities of what? Um, buffering solution. A little of the strong acid base. And you want large components of your of your of your either your weak acid and its conjugate or your weak base and its conjugate from back up here, right? I'm, we can, we're going to eventually do it when we add a strong acid, but since we did the strong base version today, um, I'm going to kind of base what I'm writing here from that. And I'm going to 
uh, symbolize our weak acid as HA. This is we want high components of my uh, weak acid and it's conjugate, and the conjugate comes from the what? The salt. Okay, good job. So then our reaction was we said the OH that we added from the strong base reacted with what? The weak acid, right? The strongest acid available. Okay, and this is the, our weak acid was stronger than than uh, H2O's ability. Acid. Okay, and what was the kicker to the whole buffering process? You remember? Most important thing. And I said, or strong to weak. So we took a strong base and converted it into a weak base which doesn't dissociate much and isn't going to change the pH that much then. So then in the end, We said that the stability of the pH or the ability of a buffer to resist the change in pH was predominantly based on what? We said it was predominantly based on of your buffer components. Remember, we started out with 0.5 of each. We reacted the strong base into a weak base, and we ended up with a ratio that was 0.51 over 0.49. The ratio was relatively constant, and that's why we didn't see a significant change in what? The H. You might want to make sure you get this down somewhere. You might actually use this at some point. What about for solutions? I'm really just summarizing everything here. If I put 0.5 moles of a strong base in this, is, is there limits to the buffering solution? Yes. Now, if I had 15 moles of my components and I added 0.5, we're probably okay. But if I add 0.5 to something that only has 0.5 components in it, we've got a problem. So there are some limitations to these buffering solutions. Okay? So the reason why our pH remained constant is because we had relatively high components in relationship to the amount of strong base that we added. Okay? So really two things are key. You want high concentration of your components and you want them to be equal. And you want to add a relatively small amount of strong base in comparison to that. Any questions that you're struggling with on this lesson? I know I kind of broke it down and repeated myself a lot of times, but good?